Hello, Professor. Uh, welcome. Thank you for. Uh, it's an honor to to have you here with us, uh, to have this this talk for uh, the Knowledge Society for Mindshop, and uh, just to give you some some context on 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 what we are and what we are trying to accomplish, is um, we ha we are 280 members across Latin America and the world, uh, so mainly Spanish speakers. So our courses are in Spanish. Uh, we have debates in Spanish, uh, social digital events as these days go, right? Uh, we are in over a hundred cities around the world. So, uh, and, and we, we haven't even finished our, our first year. So we expect to, to keep growing. Uh, essentially we study philosophy and now we're starting with some other subjects. We have a mathematics professor and a history professor. We're doing medieval history and something uh, that re would resemble uh, the history and philosophy of mathematics. We're starting to approach those, those subjects. And uh, I thought to invite you, uh, as you were my professor in, in King's College London, in my master's uh, philosophy of psychology. That's the, the, the course we had. And I have a few questions, if, if that's OK with you. So welcome, Absolutely. professor. Absolutely. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Great. Great, great. So uh, let me just take a quick look here. So my, my first question is about your academic trajectory. I would like to ask, uh, what key attitudes and strategies do you think an intellectual has to develop across the years to make substantial progress on his field? And, and more per uh, personally speaking, how have you managed to stay motivated and focused on your work across time as a philosopher? Interesting question. So I don't think of myself as entirely normal in this respect. Look, we, we, could, we could imagine there's two kinds of philosophers. I mean, most will fall in between, but some, and two kinds of academics generally, some of them work on one specific topic and they work on that topic assiduously and stick to it all through their life and they get very good at it and they become you know the real experts i mean in in my little uh philosophy textbook i did a few years ago philosophical devices i said there there's some philosophers who work only on conditional statements the analysis of conditional statements i said there's two kinds of conditional statements indicative conditionals and and so don't, there's some philosophers who work only on indicative conditionals. They don't do subjective conditionals. That's somebody else's topic. So that's one. And at the other end, there you might suppose philosophers who will just try and work on anything that interests them, anything, and they jump from one topic to another. And I think I'm much more of the second kind. I, I follow my interest and um, my interests have changed over time and I get new interests and uh, and often I'll find some topic it will interest me I'll be puzzled about it I'll be curious I think oh, no, I, I, I don't think what everybody else thinks and I try and find out about it and then I write and once I've got the topic as it were sorted out to my satisfaction I'm inclined to move on to something else that grabs my interest and uh so that's how i stay interested and i find it rather hard to imagine working in the other kind of of way you just have one topic and you stick to it but but i think it's a matter of different horses for courses as we say different mm -hmm. tastes uh i'm sure there are other philosophers who would hate to work like i do i mean i tend to leave a subject before i'm fully the master of all the angles and i can see there's a great satisfaction to be had to become real kind of complete expert on some on some topic and maybe there are people who get their satisfaction manage to stay interested by working like that so there's there's, there's different styles of being an academic and uh, some work for some people others for other people but for me it's always the interest of exploring new pastures that keeps me going that's great. So always uh, looking for the your next interest, your, your, the next big idea, without like going uh, extra like all the way to the to the end of I mean, exhausting the the possible ideas. 
Yeah, I, I understand that. Uh, I suppose there are, uh, the world needs both, right? The world needs uh, kind of both, yeah. right? So uh, following up on, on, on this, um, I read that your doctoral supervisor was Professor Ian Hacking, and it was uh, at Cambridge University, right? Yeah. Uh, could you pl please tell us a bit about that experience? And, and secondly, uh, how did this doctoral work eventually led you to London at uh, King's College, uh, where, are, where you're at now? Yes, well, Ian Hacking's a very, he's, he's a great man. He's a wonderful, wonderful philosopher, wonderful thinker. I mean, he, he ranges outside philosophy. I can remember being at the, at, in the bar after a conference. This was long ago. This was like 40 years ago. And Hugh Mellor, uh, another of the professors at Cambridge was there. And he was, he was being irritated by, I think, fire and door. And he said, these people, they just, kind of get a lot of attention a lot of people write about them because they say something that's so so silly that people start fighting about what's wrong what's most wrong with it and then he, he turned to Ian he, you know, he just was late at night he wasn't tent prepared he said unlike you Ian where you say things that seem so silly and then it turns out that you're right and uh, <laughs> now in fact he's an example I mean not just of being right but of very brilliant man. So he jumps around from topic to topic. Mm. But unlike me, it doesn't mean he just proceeds at a at a relatively superficial level, he gets to the bottom of them very quickly and then moves on to. So his first work was in the foundations of statistics. And he wrote his first book on logical statistical inference. And he did some stuff about Bayesianism that's absolutely foundational in the philosophy of probability that that uh, the principle of conditionalization is something that's not falls that doesn't fall out of the, the axioms of probability is an extra assumption he was the first person to see that see that clearly he wrote a nice paper about it and then when I was his student one of the things he was working on was logic he's got a famous paper what is logic in the in the Journal of Philosophy about uh, what makes certain inferences logical inferences, which is a topic many people write about, but he was right in there at the beginning. He, he developed one of what's now the standard, the standard uh, uh, accounts of the nature of logic. And then he did work on the history of probability, his book, The Emergence of Probability. And then he's done work on uh, uh, philosophy of science, uh, his distinctive kind of entity realism, and then probably the last 20, 20 years, 30 years, he's been writing about human kinds, about making people up, looping kinds, uh, the special category of uh, things like multiple personality disorder, fugues, autism, all kinds of stuff about, about the, the interaction between theories of humans, especially in psychiatry, and the condition that people find themselves in. So uh, great example, great example. And uh, yeah. so I follow him in jumping around between different topics, but perhaps haven't uh, got as deep as him. Uh, I, so I in, and in fact, I mean, this happened, this happened, I I'd been taught by him a bit as an undergraduate, and then I went to work with him because my I did a first degree in mathematics before I did philosophy yes. and I did mathematical statistics. So I was going to work with him on the logical statistical inference. But I became very excited when I was a young PhD student by Kuhn and Feyerab. So I wrote a PhD. I switched in the middle of my PhD from wow. statistical inference where I didn't have any very definite ideas to, to an interest in meaning variance and commensurability and the threat to scientific objectivity. And I did my PhD on that. And uh, that's an area I worked in for some while. My first book was on, was, was my PhD thesis, Theory of Meaning. Uh, uh, I a philosophy of science, right? Philosophy of science, very much. Well, philosophy of science, but it was the epistemology of science. It was, it was uh, the, the, 
the possibility of scientific objectivity, the, mm. the possibility of rationality in science. So it was in it was in the kind of uh, Popper, Kuhn, Lakatos, Feyerab tradition. Though, uh, okay, you know, I, I was also as much in the American um, logical positivist tradition at that at that time. So, and I wrote, a, and then, but my first job was teaching in a sociology department and I, really? I taught philosophy of social science. So there was an old professor, oh, University of Reading near London, Stanislav Andreski, fine fellow. And he was from, he was a Pole and he was a Polish sociologist, very much in the logical empiricist tradition. So he did comparative sociology, comparing different features of social arrangements, how they caused each other. And he wanted me to teach the students kind of Mill's methods and uh, inductive logic, but I taught them all about Kuhn and Feyerabend and scientific irrationality and so on. Wow. But very interesting. I, 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 was, I, I was never much of an irrationalist. My first book was called For Science in the Social Sciences. It was, it was an argument, For social science. sciences should be, should be scientific, should be, as it was termed in those circles, positivistic, and I was against all kinds of uh, continental theory and so on. This was back in the back in the in the seventies. So, and then I wrote another book, which was I was by then moving away from just philosophy of science towards more theory of meaning, philosophy of mind. So I wrote a book called Reality and Representation in the eighties that was an argument for metaphysical realism and it was against Dummett and Putnam and uh, Davidson people who tried to Ronald Davidson yeah, yeah against I mean against the very idea of conceptual people who had theories of truth that made it impossible for an ideal theory to be mistaken various kinds of neo-idealism neo-verificationism mm -hmm. and I argued against that in favor of of uh, kind of hard-nosed realism. Uh, uh, reality is one thing, our theories about it is something quite separate, it's quite possible for them to be different, it's a, it's a practical matter to try and get your beliefs in, into line with reality, it's not guaranteed by the nature of thought, it's something that you have to work hard to do. And uh, uh, that, was, that was that book and and by then I kind of morphed away from the philosophy of science and rationality and epistemology into naturalism. So my next book, and by then I'd moved to King's. So this was 1992, philosophical naturalism. I moved to King's College, uh, London in 1990. And uh, yeah, and by then I was working on consciousness, theory of meaning intentionality uh, as well or, physicalism, yeah intentionality that was theory. later okay. yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and physicalism physicalism has become important for me yes I, I know i remember i remember work on your course so uh so so on that note um on your philosophical positions uh, as as you just mentioned you, you you're inclined towards a naturalist worldview of the world could we like maybe go go a little bit deeper on this for or uh, because perhaps our our, our public that uh, will watch this uh, are not very familiar with this worldview? Could you please uh, tell us a bit about this and which philosophers were the ones that that inspired you towards this position and which arguments were the ones that mostly convinced you on on this uh, naturalist worldview? Okay, so. I think there's two there's two pretty separate elements in philosophical naturalism. I mean, I, I've written the Stanford Encyclopedia entry on naturalism, and it's got two parts. And I say that that uh, if you look at philosophers who call themselves naturalists, there's there's two things that that are moving them, motivating them. One, one is a view about what kinds of things there are in reality. Uh, what's reality made of? It's kind of a metaphysical scientific uh, account of uh, 
the kinds of things you can find in reality. And uh, a naturalist view would be one that said roughly they're, they're only the kinds of things that, that are described by the, by the natural sciences, so physical entities, chemical entities, complicated things, uh, uh, which are all grounded in the physical nature of the world and there aren't any supernatural entities or souls or immortal souls or uh, some kind of mind outside the physical realm that comes down and exerts an influence on what you what you do everything is part of the the, the physical world so that's that's the the ontological view it's a view about the nature of reality and uh, many philosophers are uh, somehow believe that they're committed to physicalism everything uh, is in some sense uh, physical there aren't any things in reality that are somehow additional to what you get out of the physical realm but not so many people are interested in the arguments for that why exactly should we believe this and uh and i had colleagues in cambridge in particular hugh Mello, who i mentioned earlier who who didn't believe it. He said, I, I, I don't see any reason to believe that. So I got very interested uh, around 1990 and what are the arguments in favor of, of that? And uh, why did people start believing this in the middle of the 20th century and not before? And I think there's a, an argument that uh, just starts from the premise. It's not a very complicated argument that, that uh, uh, all physical processes are entirely explained by prior mm -hmm. physical causes. causes. And there's mm -hmm. nothing that comes in from the outside and affects the physical world. And I got interested in the fact that people started arguing on the basis of this assumption in the middle of the 20th century, where philosophers hadn't especially argued on the basis of that assumption before, before that. And I think that's because this was something that science came to establish in the middle of the 20th century. And prior to that, uh, plenty of respectable scientists had thought there were special, uh, special chemical forces and special vital forces and special nervous forces. And, and it was only 20th century science that, that persuaded, persuaded our intellectual tradition against that. So that's, that's all ontological naturalism. Now, there's a, a kind of separate issue, which is an issue about the nature of philosophy, not the nature of reality. Mm. And for many philosophers, naturalism means that philosophy is continuous with science, that there isn't uh, uh, over there the scientists doing kind of experiments and observations and discovering things, and then philosophers working in some different way, using some kind of a priori insight into the nature of reality and, and figuring out things by this different kind of method. And uh, many philosophers in, in the Anli tradition, uh, perhaps not as many as are physicalists, but many think that the idea of some distinctive philosophical method makes no sense. There isn't any uh, route to a priori knowledge. If there is a priori knowledge, it's just a matter of empty analytic definitions. And any serious knowledge is in the end based on, on as Quine put it, tri the tribunal of sense experience. That it's uh, any serious knowledge is, is in the form of synthetic theories that, that uh, are chosen because they fit the observable facts. Now, I mean, you put it like that, you might wonder, well, what's left for philosophy to do? Isn't that just yeah. all science? It's everything. Uh, but question. If it's I've, I've got a, yeah. a view about that, that science doesn't, doesn't, I mean, science in the sense of thinking done by scientists mm -hmm. doesn't answer all the questions. Yeah. that are thrown up in developing scientific theories. So you will get quite often within science various kinds of puzzles like 
the interpretation of quantum mechanics or the evolution of altruism, where mm. it's not that we need more experimental data. We've got all the experimental data we can have. Our, our theories don't really make sense. I mean, we're just talking about regular yeah. scientific theories, but, but at the heart of the theories, there's some kind of, of contradiction. There's assumptions in the theories that are leading to paradox. And I think that that's, that's where philosophy comes in. Philosophers are trained to try and figure out what's going on when our, our theories get in a tangle. Scientists aren't trained to do that. I mean, some of the very smart scientists with philosophical inclinations will do that. So some of the best people Absolutely. working on the foundations of quantum mechanics mm -hmm. are physicists, but lots of other physicists say, no, we don't want to do that. We, I mean, we're not doing experiments, we're scientists, we do experiments. And we don't, yeah. like, we don't like thinking about these messy, complicated things where there's no straightforward experimental resolution. So that there's parts of science which are, if you think about them, inevitably philosophical. And, and I also think that the same kind of a issue arises in connection with, with kind of more mundane everyday thinking. I don't think science as done by official scientists and science departments exhausts our uh, synthetic, empirically based knowledge of the world. I mean, science is kind of sustained by a great uh, range of background assumptions we get from common sense and tradition. And there's important questions about how far all those assumptions are are yeah. coherent and consistent, and in particular, coherent and consistent in combination with science. So there's a great deal of work to be done by philosophers in, again, resolving tangles, puzzles that when we put common sense together with science or common sense together with other bits of common sense, uh, uh, there's something wrong in our thinking, but where is it wrong? And so that's what I think is distinctive about philosophy. We resolve theoretical tangles, but in the end, we aren't doing we aren't after anything different from what science is after. We're after coherent theories that fit the observable facts. It's just that there's kind of two obstacles we have to overcome to get coherent theories that fit the observable facts. Sometimes we don't have enough observable facts. We need to gather more facts. That's a regular scientist. And sometimes we have a tangle in our theories that needs to be unraveled and that's the philosophers. So that's, that's my work. Okay. That's my that's my <laughs> that's my methodological naturalism. Okay. The thesis about the nature of philosophical practice, and uh, at first pass, philosophers are doing just the same thing as science. But then, if you want to know why they're philosophy departments as well as science departments, there's two different jobs to be completed if we want to develop complete and coherent scientific theories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'm sure. I'm sure this. I mean, this this answer. Uh, I'm sure some of the people that are watching this uh, might have lost us a bit, but we'll we'll yeah. bring them back. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, uh, I didn't know that you wrote an article in in, uh, in the Encyclopedia of Philosophy. I'll, I'll share that as well with the with our students so they can take a look. Stanford Encyclopedia. It, 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 it goes through just just what I've been what I've been talking about. But no, do do stop me if I'm getting too... No, 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 no. That's perfect. That's perfect. And, this and, is... and we can go more slowly. No, go... this is perfect. This is perfect. So uh, a question, a follow-up question, I mean, following on, on this line, and, and perhaps I may be wrong, but is intentionality and, and consciousness one of these one of these issues that you mentioned that philosophers need to untangle in a way, because I know that you, I mean, you, you did a lot of work on, on the problem of, of, of intentionality and especially on the teleosemantic answer to this problem. Uh, yeah. Would this be included on this uh, scientific philosophical tangles that you mentioned? Sure. So if, if you have the, ontologically naturalist view I had ontology is to do with what exists what's the nature of reality and if you have the view that that look everything is is physical mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you might worry isn't that gonna exclude a lot of things and uh, 
Uh, I mean, if everything's physical, doesn't doesn't that mean there's no there's no immortal souls? Well, yes, it does mean there's no immortal souls. If you ask me, I mean, you might try and think of some physical immortal souls, but that's kind of hard hard work. So, but does it mean that there's no consciousness? Mm. And uh, many people have a strong conviction that consciousness is something over and above the yes. physical realm, that, that it's perfectly possible that you could have a zombie, a being who's physically just like me, has no feelings. That's kind of, a, I mean, that's not an argument. That's just an expression of the thought that consciousness is something extra okay. to what's going on physically. Uh, if a physicalist agrees about that and then says, look, everything, there's nothing that isn't physical, then they're going to end up denying that there's any consciousness, which seems a crazy position. So, so one task for a physicalist to ex is, is to explain how, how there can be consciousness in a purely physical world. So, right, you might say that there can't be immortal souls in a purely physical world, but you, you want to say, but look, no, I, I do think there can be consciousness. So, so that's a challenge to explain how there can be consciousness in a purely physical world. Purely physical world. Yeah. I mean, now, a related challenge is, well, if everything is physical, does that mean there's no... There's no intentionality, there's no meaning. I mean, consciousness is one aspect of mind, but another aspect of mind is that I, I seem to have the power to think about things in the external world. I can think about uh, uh, you. I can think about People you being uh, in Mexico. On the other side are of the Mexico? world, yeah. Are you, in Mexico? are you in Mexico City? I'm in Monterey. I'm in Monterey, in the in Monterey. Towards, towards the I, north. I, 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 so there you are. I, I, I now believe that you're in Monterey. So I, I, I have a thought, which presumably is inside my, my head. Uh, and it's about a city. Uh, what is it? Six, six time zones away. Uh, yeah, six, uh, it's 11.30 here. Six time zones, a quarter of the way around the world, 5,000 miles yeah. away. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so I mean, how is that possible? How how can something inside my head be about something on the other side of the world? No, I mean, uh, some people might think this is to do with consciousness. Uh, that that there's something special about consciousness that enables this to that enables this take place. But I I'm not sure that's the right way to explain it but so that's another challenge for the physicalist to explain how there can be intentionality how there can be meaning how there can be mm. representation in a purely physical, representation Mental in a purely space. physical world and so i mean i've written a lot about both those issues about about how to think about consciousness as being present in a purely physical world and how to think about uh the possibility of representation in a purely mm. physical world and in fact, I've just finished a new book mm. uh, called The Metaphysics of Sensory Experience, wow. which at least with respect to, to sensory uh, uh, representation, the representation we have when we have vision and hearing and so on, where the, the, the main point of the book is to argue that sensory consciousness and sensory representation are two separate things. Sensory consciousness and sensory representation are, are two, two separate, separate things. things. Okay. And so, I mean, so there's, there's one set of facts that make my sensory experiences conscious, and there's another set of facts that make my sensory experience represent what it does, and they aren't the same set of facts. These two things are independent okay. features of. Uh, What's going on in me when I have sensory experience? Okay. I, I had another I had another question, but I have a better one. Uh, so uh, now on this on this topic, oh, because uh, well, I'm I'm sure you address the the Frank Jackson's uh, Mary thought experiment, yeah. right? So in this in this answer, so Mary exits the the the, the room. Right. Yeah. Well, ju just to make a, a small parenthesis for the people that are listening to us, the 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 the, the Mary thought experiment is about the concept of qualia, right? 
and uh, she's a, a, a girl that's been in a, in a room trapped all of her life, living in a black and white room with uh, no color at all. And she studies uh, color science, right? And she studies everything to know, every physical fact about, about color. And then she exits the room and she sees the world for the first time. And what happens there, right? Is, does she learn something new? Uh, and what is that? In, in, um, just to give us some context. Um, right. Yeah. So you want to know what what I say in response to this argument? Yeah. I, how, how would it work on these two separate facts? Um, on, on this, I mean, would she would learn something or how would okay. it work? Okay. Yeah. What we're interested in is what goes on in people when, say, they look at a red tomato and they have an experience as of something red, right? So they have yeah. a certain kind of experience. A certain kind of experience. And the physicalist wants to say, look, all that's going on is certain neural activities. There's a certain kind of neural oscillation in V4, a certain area of our brain. And the physicalist will say that the conscious sensory experience is nothing different from that neural activity. Mm. It's just how it is for you when you have that neural activity. I mean, if you want to put it in terms of what it's like, I, I mean, uh, uh, when, when you're the being who's got that neural activity, well, then it's a certain way for you, the certain you, okay. way you, you, you experience when you have the neural activity. Okay. That's the physicalist view. There's nothing over and above the neural activity, but when you have the neural activity, it feels a certain way. Okay. Now, now the, 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 the dualist view is, no, no, it makes no sense that, that consciousness feelings should just be neural activity. That uh, uh, What's really happening is that there's a neural activity and then this causes the extra thing, the feeling. The, the feeling is something extra to the neural activity. That wouldn't be considered yeah. physical. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay, so that's that's the, the two options, the physicalist view and the dualist view that says there's mm. something extra. Mm -hmm. Now, Jackson has an argument that's supposed to show that dualism is true. And the mm -hmm. argument is, consider somebody, Mary, the super scientist in the future, who knows everything about brains and uh, uh, rods and cones in the eye and the neural oscillations. And before she knows what goes on in people mm -hmm. uh, at a physical level, where, where they, when they have an experience of something red when they see something red mm. uh, but does she know about the experience itself mm. and jackson says no and look when she comes out the room and she's actually shown a red rose uh, red tomato uh, she knows mm. something she didn't know before she knows this is what it's like i mean then you know later on she sees something green she looks at some some kind of grass and uh and and now she knows that's what it's like to look at grass. And and she didn't know that before. I mean, for all she knew before, it might have been the other way around. That you know, seeing red tomatoes was like looking at grass. And, and, you were something uh, different. She's, she's really discovered something she didn't know before. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, sure and so so there's an argument. She knew all the physical facts. Now she's learned an extra fact. Uh, there must be some facts that aren't physical facts. Yeah. Uh, very nice argument. Uh, <laughs> And you want to know the physicalist response? Yeah, yeah. I mean, on on, on this view uh, of your new book, on the two separate, yeah, you know, yeah, the facts, yeah. So the standard physicalist response is that Mary hasn't learned about a new fact that she didn't know about before. All she's all that's happened is she's acquired a new way of thinking about the same fact. So, mm -hmm. so now she can think about this fact, not just using scientific words like oscillation in V4, but by recreating the experience for herself uh, and, and imagining it. So she, she turns on her brain, the physicist will say, she gets the oscillation in V4, and that's her new way of thinking about the experience. She can think about the experience by recreating it in her mind. In and her she, couldn't do that. she couldn't do that before because she'd never had the experience. She didn't really know how to turn that bit of her mind on. So all that's happened is she's got a new word, as it were, a new word in her language of thought 
for the same thing that she could always refer to as, as that oscillation in V4. Mm -hmm. So that's the only change. I mean, of course, there's another change. What's changed is she's now had the experience. She's now had the experience. Had it before. But, but the physicalist doesn't have Still any problem physical with that. experience. Yeah. yeah, I mean, what's happened is, is a certain kind of oscillations happen in her brain. This never mm -hmm. happened before. Mm -hmm. So that difference is no problem for the physicalist. And if Jackson says, oh, but she knows about something that she didn't know about before, physicists will say no. No, not in the terms of knowing about some feature of the world she didn't know about before. She always knew about the neural oscillation in V4. Sure, I didn't about that. But what she's got is a new, a, a new way of thinking about it. She can imagine it now when she couldn't imagine it before. Mm -hmm. So, the, so the physicists will say, look, it's, it's like somebody who. So, Cary Grant's a film star, right? And uh, mm -hmm. and some somebody might know. Look. Uh, Archie Leach went to school, was born in Bristol, right? And then the mm. person reads in a in, uh, 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 movie magazine that Cary Grant was born in Bristol. In fact, yeah. I mean, Cary Grant is Archie Leach. Suppose the person doing the reading doesn't, doesn't know this. So You're the same person, yeah. Uh, have, have they learned some new fact? Well, in a sense, yes, they've got a, 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 a new concept and they can think this fact with the new concept. So, I mean, they didn't know that Cary mm. Grant did born in Bristol and uh, now they do know that Cary Grant's born in Bristol even. But mm -hmm. have they learned about some extra person? Uh, have, I mean, should they now it's add the one same to guy. The, to yeah. the birth rate? Exactly, so, so that's, that's, that's the, mm. the model. So uh, uh, Mary has just learned a new name, a new way of thinking about what's really just a physical process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, wow. So, you, are you convinced? <laughs> are you convinced? Oh. I, 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 ever since we had the class and we took all of the all of the the physicalism stuff, I, I am convinced. I am convinced in a way, uh, in a way because uh, I suppose we still have to articulate it. Uh, no, yeah, it, it, I mean it, it checks out. I mean it makes sense. Uh, but when you're when you're when you haven't haven't thought about this problem for a long time, uh, you know. As you have lived your life before facing these arguments, uh, there's kind of this momentum that uh, logically you have to break it and, and understand it to find the, the you know what what makes more sense you know, uh, but it, it isn't. Is so, so I, I I agree with you that it it seems wrong that the experience is just the brain process intuitively. It, it word, yeah. strikes everybody, it strikes me half the time that, that surely the, the consciousness is something, yeah. something extra. Mm. But then, then there are these very strong arguments I mentioned uh, that uh, everything must be physical. I mean, yeah, there are. You, you see what a mess you get into if you think there's this extra thing yeah. that's not physical, but you also think the thought I mentioned earlier that. that uh, all physical effects, all physical processes are due to prior physical causes. They're completely accounted for at the physical level. So yes, if you see yes. that, which science seems to show us, and you also think that the consciousness is extra, well, then, then the consciousness has to be epiphenomenal. It doesn't make yeah. any difference. To what like goes the, in the ghost in the machine, right? That's the example. It would be like a ghost in the machine, like uh, switching yeah, up and down. Worse, worse than a ghost. It would be a. It would be an impotent ghost. An, an, <laughs> an, an, an that wouldn't do anything. <laughs> exactly. It, it, it yeah. would be a dangler. And a dangler. And so now, I mean, now this is. You know, we're talking about substantial facts. In the real world, we aren't just analyzing concepts. We're trying to figure out what's really there, mm. but we're in a tangle. We're in a tangle. It can't. It can't be true that consciousness is extra to the brain processes. That mm. every physical effect has a physical cause is completely accounted for yeah. uh, at uh, the physical level. And, Either one or the and, other. Yeah. And, and that conscious, conscious. Uh, events in my brain make a difference to what I do. Something's got to give. So that, that's a classic give. philosophical tangle. Yeah. And uh, uh, it seems to me that the thing that should give is that uh, 
the experiences are extra to the brain processes. Now, I mean, as I said, it, it, that seems a very intuitive thought. So one question is, why does it seem so intuitive if it's false? Mm -hmm. Another mm -hmm. question is, right, there's people give arguments like Jackson's argument and associated arguments by David Chalmers. So are the arguments any good? So we, ha we have to go through everything. We have to figure out what are the, what are the options here? What is the best way of, of ending up with a coherent theory when, when our, the thoughts we get from, from everyday thought and science are inconsistent. They're, they're in the tank. Yes, 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 definitely. I'm, I'm, no worries, no worries. Yeah, I, I've just muted you. You can take the, the call. You can, uh, could you unmute? I, I, I muted you so you can, uh, could you unmute? No, I cannot hear you, Professor. Could you unmute there on, on Zoom? It's fine, it's fine. It's ah, just, there we go. It was my son, he was saying about nothing. I'll, I'll turn it back when we're done. Ah, okay, no worries, no worries. Okay, okay. So, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm fascinated by all these questions and they are probably the, the one of the toughest questions we have uh, today in, 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 in these fields. Uh, but, but moving to a lighter note, um, or perhaps not so light, uh, you, you're gonna be the one that, that could tell me. Uh, you wrote a book on 2017, called uh, knowing the score and uh, I got a I mean a small a small description of this uh, on knowing the score you, you take a look at a number of ways in which sporting issues cast light on long-standing philosophical problems uh, yeah. I, I haven't read the book uh, but I would like to ask um, how I mean because you've done most of your work if not all of your work is on pure philosophy right uh, and then uh, this is seems like a book for the the for the general public in a way and it's kind of an applied philosophy isn't it yeah. Could you tell us a bit about about this about yeah where it came from and, yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, where it came from and some some examples perhaps I've, maybe I've, a few I've, never, I've never set out to just be a pure abstract philosopher and not not write about things that are of interest to of oh, course people outside philosophy and uh, I mean, as much as I've written, I suppose it's all academic philosophy. I've, I've done quite a lot of writing for, for newspapers and so on. Mm, okay, okay. Book reviewing, but, but nothing sustained. But uh, no, what happened was, was it was, it was almost an accident. Uh, mm. So I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm very active sports person. I've played, Played a lot of cricket when I was younger, and uh, uh, hockey and rugby. You know, so I'm just trying to remember. After I left school, I have competed in you know, official official events with with uh, you know uh, referees in in soccer and rugby, football and hockey and golf and tennis and cricket and sailing. So uh, I think uh, maybe there's another one, but anyway, at, at least seven different. So uh, yeah, I spent a lot of, a lot of my time, uh, uh, I'm not very good at anything. I mean, I'm just an enthusiastic amateur and I spent a lot of my time doing that and a lot of time watching sport. And uh, I never really thought of combining this interest with my philosophical activities. I mean, there, there is an area of philosophy, philosophy of sport, and I've got a bit involved with, with it, but uh, I was never very excited by it. I mean, it's uh, it wrote about the, the nature and value of sport and the mm. ethics of sport and uh, doping and the ethics of doping and so on, mm -hmm. which are things I, I don't write very much about in the book, if at all. But what happened is somebody asked me to give a talk in a series on the philosophy of sport. It was, it was the, the 2012 Olympics in Britain and the Royal Institute of Philosophy said, right, we're going to do a theory, a series on the philosophy of sports. And then I, I they said, will you give a talk? And I thought, well, you know, I'm very interested in sport and I'm hmm. a philosopher and the Olympics and yeah, come yeah. on, I'll, I'll Makes go. sense. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I started writing about it but I started thinking about the 
the definition of sport and why sport is important and valuable and I was getting nowhere. It was really very boring and I started to have nightmares about the lecture happening and I had nothing to say. <laughs> and, and then I thought, I mean, I, I'd been working with a PhD student who was working on, on the structure of action and how much action is automatic and how much action is is controlled by our planning and intentions and and working with her I'd kind of got interested in the idea that lots of lot of activity that we think is under conscious control is really just uh, kind of unthinking routines that we execute without without any conscious control and I think, I mean, I don't know if it's in her thesis, but when she was thinking about this, I got very interested in the sporting examples where you have fast reactions, which are cricket, baseball, tennis, squash, okay. table tennis. Lightning response. You've, you've right. got less yeah. than yeah. half a second. The ball less takes half, half a second to get to you. You've got to shape your shot in less than half a second. And, and so first thought is it's just reflex. It's just reflex. But then there's a second thought, which is you have to choose your tactics. And, you know, you, I'm not going to play to his backhand. His backhand is very strong. So it can't be just reflex. It's being consciously controlled. But at the same time, it's just reflex. And I thought this is a, so I, I, I gave my lecture about that. And I used examples from from uh, various sports I knew about. And I told lots of sporting stories. And it was fun. It was fun. I really like doing this. I mean, I because uh, you know, I, I, I could be interesting for people who are interested in sport, and also I made what I thought was a novel philosophical point that 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 uh, somehow our systems of controlling our actions are structured so that decisions we make, uh, say before the match, mm -hmm. can control these uh, eye blink fast reflexes, and that's kind wow. of weird, and uh, so. And in fact, that's the first three chapters of the book. Look at different angles of that. And, and, then, and then having done this talk, I thought this is really interesting. I mean, I've got a novel philosophical view out of thinking about, about sporting puzzles, a puzzle that comes up in sport. And I, 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 just, I just got myself a new website and it had a, a blog facility. So I started blogging about about this and and it kind of took off i mean i did a couple on this action control thing and then i did some stuff about well suddenly i, I there were a whole lot of topics wow. that, so i wrote like maybe the second one was about fandom so mm. why is it so important to some people that their their team wins, wins. so yeah it's really it's valuable i really mean significant it's, it's for not just that I, I desire but but uh, I regard it as a good thing that uh, mm. that Tottenham Hotspurs win, but but look, I'm a I'm a sane person. I I can't really think it's kind of valuable from God's point of view that Tottenham wins. Where uh, the Arsenal fans just have as good a good a claim, and so I started thinking about the fact that people can simultaneously regard something as genuinely valuable for them when it's not valuable subspecie eternitatis and uh and so there's this idea of agent agent relative values that some philosophers have talked about and and i used the case of sporting fandom to think about that and and then i thought about about cooperation uh prisoners dilemmas in the mm. context of of cycle racing if i don't know if any of you wow. or your listeners are cyclists but but in cycle races you will see people cooperating even though they're on different teams mm, and uh, wow. they, their interests are opposed side. And then there was stuff about, about what counts as bad behavior in sports. Is it breaking the rules? No, no, people uh, often break the rules. I mean, uh, knowingly break the rules and, uh, uh, you know, you take the throw in in the, in the soccer match uh, closer than when yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Nobody worry. Not, not even the referees worry about that. Then there's some things the referees worry part about. Part of the game. Yeah, is it part of the game? But, like, yeah. but, but that's part of the game. And then there's some things that the referees will blow up for, but the players regard that's what you do. It's a, it's a so-called professional foul. I mean, some mm. professional fouls are nasty, but others aren't very nasty. And then mm. there's things that the players won't do that the referee wouldn't blow up for that they regard as unacceptable. I mean, like, you know, the other side... Uh, kicks the ball out when your player's injured, you have to give it back to them. That's not in the rules. And and so there's a lot of issues mm. about, uh, uh, and I said, look, it, it, there's, there's whole levels here. There's the rules as written down. There's the rules as applied by the referee. There's the, the code of fair play agreed by the players. And then, and, and my first thought was that's roughly what's morally required. You've got to stick to the, the code agreed by the players, but then there's cases where the code agreed by the players is, in fact, uh, uh, objectively immoral. I mean, think about all the cyclists who agreed that they were going to be doping and then lied to the public. I mean, there's something immoral. Wow. Yeah. And I, I, you can have different views. I, I think that in soccer, feigning an injury in order to get one of the opponents sent off, I don't think that's part of the game. I think that's just it's that's just, the, it's that's just cheating nasty. in a way <laughs> yeah that's nasty that's nasty but so it is very nasty. very interesting issues here and I, and I compared that to to breaking the law is breaking the law always uh immoral and uh very interesting analogies mm. and so there were there, there were lots of things to write about and lots of different areas where where and it worked both ways that that uh thinking about the sporting examples showed you philosophical points that you wouldn't get get from non-sporting examples you could think of sport as a kind of particle accelerator it shows what humans do in extreme situations mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but also the other way around i mean in some cases i could take uh, well-known philosophical ideas and show how they they uh, made sense of what's going on in sport in ways that wouldn't occur to your normal sports fan. So that that's the book, Knowing okay. the Score, nice. uh, 2017. Do do tell you do tell your listeners to. Of course, is it in Spanish? Is it is it translated to Spanish or no? Um, not unfortunately, yet. unfortunately not. No, no. no. Oh, okay. Well, we could talk about it if you're interested. Uh, I mean, uh, I don't know how many pages it is, but I mean, I'm a good translator. I've done a lot of translation yeah. of philosophy. Well, have have a look if if you're interested. I mean, it's been translated into Dutch and in to Chinese and wow. uh, uh, so but only I will those take two. a look so, I I know, if, if, if any if any of you or any of your listeners uh, mm -hmm. I'd be very pleased to arrange that uh, of I, course uh, yeah yeah uh, so uh, well just as a parenthesis uh, yeah. when, when we uh, every talk we do on, on Mindshop we translate it to Spanish we have the transcript and we add the subtitles so people in Latin America and other uh, Spanish speaking uh, persons can can access this this information which is is, is very good so uh so I, getting... I, 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 I want to tell you a funny story quickly yeah about, yeah sure about, go for about, it about, about the dutch translation and it's okay. to do with that thing mm -hmm. about feigning injuries to get your your opponent sent off okay and and i said well you know it's been coming into soccer but uh, and uh uh so maybe this has become part of the code of fair play and i described a case where a german player uh, uh muller uh, uh, arguably feigned injury to get Pepe sent off in, I think. Mm. So where are we? 2014 World Cup, I think. Okay, uh, Brazil. And and I said I was shocked. I mean, I, the, my thought was that Germans don't do that. Germans don't behave like that. The Germans are, uh, are yeah, honest, like, honest, honest, yeah, honest, yeah. honest, honest players. And uh, and I use that to to explain. Look, there, there is a question about even if after it's the code of agreed by the players, is it is it is it objectively moral? But the Dutch writer, the Dutch translator said, Look, we can't leave this in like this because in Holland, uh, our view is the Germans <laughs> are all dirty cheats, right? Oh. And uh, 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 we, we have a <laughs> term for diving, yeah, yeah. which, which is uh, the, the German word for swallow, which because it's, it's Germans who dive in, in, in wow. order to- Wow, it's cultural. Them. So they wouldn't so translate it, they, they denied. They, they, I, think, I, think they, I think they put a footnote in to, to explain. <laughs> because they, they said it wouldn't make any sense. It wouldn't work. 
Wow. So it would be interest. It would be interesting to see if there are any things in the book that wouldn't work for the Spanish readers. Well, well, both in, in in Spanish and in Portuguese, because well, uh, I I don't know if you recall, but I was born in Brazil, but uh, I grew up in Mexico. So both, I mean, soccer is is something much more of a religion than a sport yeah. on this side of the world, and it would be interesting to look at the nuances of the translations. Yeah. Uh, no, it, it it was it was the, if I got it right, the German. Portuguese game. It was Pepe, the defender, who mm -hmm. who reacted the German to Portuguese something that Muller did, and Muller clutched his face and fell to the ground. And uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. man. Pepe got so angry he had then hit him and got sent off. But that wasn't the interesting bit. It was the first bit where Muller clutched his face. Anyway, actually, one of our members, he uh, Carlos uh, Guerrero, if I'm not mistaken, he actually studies. Um, uh, being um, a coach, a sports coach, uh, football here, football is, yeah. is massive in Mexico. I'm sure, I'm sure yeah. you know. Yeah, but uh, well, uh, go, coming towards uh, the end of our of our talk, we, our time is almost up. I have two two last questions, uh, and it's about about the knowledge society, about MindShop, right? So, uh, I think people these days don't really take the time to you know tend to those trees that take. Uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of, of years to grow. You know, looking really, really into the future. Uh, not necessarily on this side of the world. I mean, generally, people are much more immediate, immediatists. But that doesn't mean that there are some societies that last for a long time. You have the Aristotelian society and some other societies that have, have been uh, existing for a long time. I know that you have been uh, part, a key part of this, uh, of this, and other societies as well in the in Europe you know, in the UK and uh, my question would be I mean concerning our knowledge society how could we design it in a way that we can make uh, important and, and significant impacts in in the world and in this side of the world well the world the Spanish-speaking world for example or the whole world uh, yeah. How could we do this in such a way that we can uh, endure this test of time, you know, because that's what we're going for. We're going for something that can uh, outlive us, us all in a way. Maybe the answer comes of, out of what I said was the nature of philosophy. So, I, I mean, I don't know how you're approaching your content but i like to think of philosophy as i said as a matter of trying to resolve tangles in our thinking trying to find places i mean i don't think philosophy has a special subject matter like the ethical life or, or metaphysics you know what what are properties? I, I, I don't think there's any well-defined traditional subject matter for philosophy. I think philosophy can arise in any area, and in any area of thought, you'll find some puzzle. I mean, so I just had one in sport. I mean, how how can a certain action be an instantaneous reflex, and yet under conscious control? I mean, that that really does look like. A, a, a theoretical puzzle and uh, and it kind of takes some philosophical thinking to 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 work out how those two things can both be true so now that's not to say that you should you should go away from traditional areas of philosophy like ethics or or metaphysics but I think you should always try and start with with a with a puzzle with something that will grab intellectually curious people some some you know way of putting an issue that the kind of person will come to your come to your knowledge society uh, will grab them i mean they won't be able to leave it i mean that's that's the way i like to do philosophy to, to, to start with with a with a puzzle uh, you know grasp something that, that uh, Look, we're in a mess here. Our thinking's in a mess. We don't understand something. What are we going to do? How can uh, we? Okay. Yeah. Great. So, That's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. tackling this, um, not necessarily the classical, uh, the classical fields. So for now, I'm 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 doing uh, a general course of philosophy to get uh, our members in 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 a level of philosophy, and uh, after this, I'm going to start working on 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 these kinds of problems more. 
more applied and more multidisciplinary problems. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. Um, okay, and finally, let us imagine that our knowledge society fulfills this vision and it, it really lasts, uh, I don't know, 500, 1,000 years, 1. 1.500 years. Uh, what message would you give to these future members uh, when it comes to, to philosophy and, and, and attitudes towards philosophy? No? you know, towards the deep future? Oh, that's difficult. I, I, I have, it's easier to, to, to have a message for... For today, future. right? <laughs> yeah. But maybe... Uh, don't underestimate the importance of getting at the facts. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that uh, one one threat we have now in social media bubbles is that uh, people on on both sides of political debates uh, are are just uh, confirming their their pre-established prejudices and not trying to find out where they're mistaken, not trying to to get their thoughts into line with reality. And, and the trouble is that if you don't get your thoughts into line with reality, your projects will fail. And uh, in the extreme, if we don't get our thoughts into line with reality about, about, uh, about global warming, about, about uh, the threat of, of pandemics and so on, we we're quite likely to perish. And so uh, the importance of getting at the truth, that's the message I would the importance of getting at the truth. And, and don't take it for granted. It's, uh, it's an interesting thing. I mean, the modern world, we've got two contrary uh, exemplars. So there's, there's social media, Twitter, Facebook, people in their bubbles just reconfirming their pre existing prejudices. Mm. But on the other side, we have Wikipedia. Wikipedia mm. is is if you ask me a beacon for hope who would have thought who would have thought that a publicly edited encyclopedia yeah would be such that that good ideas drive out bad that the truth drives out the fabrications uh well it's i mean i wouldn't have predicted it it's something yeah. that happens uh we should we should all be all be grateful so uh again uh, cherish cherish getting your getting your beliefs to be true very well well professor it's been an honor thank you very much uh we could go on and we should do this again sometime in the future definitely I, I with, like that. with I like some that. different questions but well uh i won't take any more of your time i just like to say uh in in the na name of of all of our society we we really thank you for this and um uh hopefully we could see each other sometime in the future if this yeah. pandemic, uh, you know, if we get this, this, these problems fixed, we can travel again and perhaps we could. We that could. would be great, great to meet up, Matthias. We could have a few, a few beers. But we in, in the meantime, uh, all the best to you, all the best to your projects, to your knowledge society. Hope Thank it you. all goes well. Thank you very great. much, Professor. Have a nice day. Take you care. too. Bye-bye.